Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Leela Higgins. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Great, love that we've got some students in the audience. Um, thanks for all for making the trek down to Irvine. Um, so we're gonna be talking about connecting with urban nature, specifically urban nature, in the age of extinction, in the Anthropocene, the age and epoch that we are now in. I wanted to, first of all, take a moment to look at this gorgeous fly. <laughs> Two words that a lot of people don't usually put together, right? So this is one of my favorite flies in Los Angeles. It is a flower-loving fly. It is from the El Segundo sand dunes. So they're pollinators, they're quite large, they're, a couple, they're about an inch and a bit. Um, and they were thought to be extinct for 30 years. And then in 2001, in the summer, some scientists were out in this, the remaining sand dune habitat. There's not that much left. And they found some of these adult flies out and about. Can you imagine if you were the person that was there finding them, how excited you'd be? I would have lost it. Um, but this fly is going to come back a few times throughout this story. But I just wanted to talk about extinction in a very local case. Again, the species was thought to be extinct. It's not. But they're on the edge. There's only 100 or so individuals out and about every summer. The rest of the time, their grubs are underground. So as many of you know, there's a lot of people on this planet. We're getting really close to 8 billion. And you've probably seen graphs like this many times, going from not that many people, not that many people, exponential growth. And more people live in cities than in not, that not in cities. So more people live in places like LA and Tokyo and Delhi and South Africa, Pretoria, than in the countryside, which is where I grew up. And with that move from rural living to city living, people have started to get kind of disconnected from nature. This is really um, kind of brought to light in the fact that in the Oxford Junior Dictionary recently, many words were deleted. Acorn, fern, willow, my favorite fungus. And they were replaced with words like MP3 player, blog, and chat room. Now, this isn't because the people who wrote the dictionary decided, let's just delete all those words. We don't need them. They actually go through an entire process of looking at a lot of children's books, and then what words are coming up and what words are not. And so it's not they didn't make the decision to let's delete acorn and fungus. It's just what books are coming out and what children are reading. I still think it's sad. And the authors of this book thought it was sad, too. And so they decided, with those lost words, with the words that were deleted from the dictionary, to make a children's book almost like poetry for each of those words. It's very beautifully illustrated. And it helps to bring, they were hoping that it would help to bring children, especially in the UK, um, where the Oxford English Dictionary is um, you know, housed and located, but hopefully for children also all around the world. And that's really dear to my heart as well. Have you guys heard of the word endling? So the word endling was coined um, originally for the last person in a family lineage that was alive. But scientists have now started to use it for the last individual of a species that is alive on the planet. Literally the one before, the penultimate individual before the species becomes extinct. And this artist, Corey Bing, created some pins to help commemorate the endlings. Some of you might have heard of Martha, the passenger pigeon, who um, passed away in 1914. Uh, Martha lived in a cage, and Incas, the, um, California par uh, sorry, the Carolina parakeet, also lived in that cage and went extinct in 1918. Then there's Lonesome George, which many of you have heard about maybe, giant tortoise, um, the last Pinta Island tortoise uh, in existence, and he went extinct. He died, and then 
thereby the species line went extinct in 2012. So again, this is all really sad news, but it's not just these one, one individuals, it is across the board. Has anyone, uh, did anyone read the IPBES report that came out? It was after the, uh, the um, climate change report that came out that said we've only got so many years, 12 years I think it was, to make changes to decrease our carbon going into the atmosphere. And then in May of this year, the IPBS report came out and the headlines were also very shocking. Um, they anticipated that within the next decade or so, a, a million species are at risk of going extinct. One million. And I study insects and there's only one line here that that, that relates to insects, the dragonflies. I love dragonflies, but there's so many other insects out there. There are about one million described insects on the planet. They estimate that there could be up to nine million, maybe you know, 30 million insects that are undescribed. Um, so again, we're in, we're in a dire situation and it's very depressing. And when I tell people these stories, it, makes people have eco-fatigue and green guilt. And it's not super motivational to be like, oh, it's almost like overwhelming. What can we do? There's nothing I can do. I'm just gonna shut down and turn off. But I think that the thing to do is to try to lead with hope. And I want to tell you a little bit about myself, going back to that badger story, um, to help you understand why I have hope and the work that I do that hopefully is hopeful. Uh, how many times can I get hope in a sentence? <laughs> so this is me when I was a kid. Um, that's me and my sister. Uh, so I grew up on a farm in England and my sister and I used to pretend to be badgers. We'd go out the back door, go down the country lane, climb over an old rusty gate, walk across a cow field, jump over a little stream, to end up standing underneath a grand old hollow tree. And it was inside of this tree that she and I would become badgers. We'd crawl through the little entrances, slithering through the sand, trying not to get spider webs in our really curly hair. And we just loved it. And that is how I learned to love nature. Then when I was 14 years old, I moved from this neighborhood to this neighborhood. <laughs> from the English countryside, almost in the middle of nowhere, to Southern California's Inland Empire. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have culture shock, but I did have nature shock, big time. I literally had no idea how to understand or read this new environment that I was living in. I was used to looking out my window and seeing fields and landscapes that looked like this. And now I was in a place where there were hillsides that looked like this. They were so dry and brown. I thought that they were just dead places. I didn't understand that there was life living there. And it wasn't until I went to UC Riverside and studied entomology for four years, the study of bugs, insects, yay, um, that I started to see these hillsides as actually places that were teeming with life, hundreds of thousands of insects and I took every single one of those insect pictures. <laughs> Woo! Um, fast forward to 2008, and I have literally just landed my dream job at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I was so excited I was gonna get to work at one of the world's leading natural history institutions. I was gonna get to geek out with other scientists. I was gonna get to share my passion of nature and insects specifically with the general public. But my family thought I was cuckoo. Why are you moving to LA, Leela? You love nature. There's no nature there. From the very beginning, I was out to prove them wrong. No, there is so much nature in LA, I cannot wait to find it, I cannot wait to show it to you, I cannot wait to share it with people all over the world. And so I'm gonna share with you some of the creatures uh, that I found over the last 10 years of living and working in Los Angeles. You guys ready? Yes. I found wild purple mushrooms up in Griffith Park. It's a wood bolete. They're also edible. The cutest baby octopus <laughs> in the tide pools down in San Pedro. Glowing scorpions of my favorite campground in the San Gabriel Mountains. 
yes, I took a UV light and illuminated it for all my friends. And then they're like, can you come in my tent and make sure there's no scorpions in my tent? <laughs> Wolf's milk slime mold. Yeah. On a rotting log close to the Los Angeles River. Not to mention the hundreds of pollinators and other insects that live in the nature gardens that I helped to build and design of the Natural History Museum. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And old weaver spiders in a men's restroom in Long Beach. <laughs> now, I was specifically in the men's restroom looking for old weaver spiders, not doing anything illegal or weird. None of us at the museum do anything weird. There will be more stories about scientists doing weird things. But yes, this beautiful spider on a men's restroom. So I hope that this is just a tiny, tiny snapshot of how much amazing nature is in Los Angeles. And I think it surprises people, people who aren't into nature, who don't live in LA, because when people think of Los Angeles, they think of this. When I ask people around the world, when I tell you the word Los Angeles, what are the things that it makes you think of? Movie stars, cement jungle, traffic, smog, sometimes beaches and mountains. Yay, that's nature-ish. But people think of things like this. And it's, you know, hard, because this is what Los Angeles looks like. There's the gorgeous LA River. I'm not being joking there. I really do love the LA River. Cutting through here, we've got downtown LA, all of this industry, but oh my gosh, there's so much cement, right? So many shipping containers. And so it's hard to focus in and be like, no, look at all those trees, look at those neighborhoods, look at the San Gabriel Mountains in the background, look at the Santa Monica Mountains in between. There must be a lot of nature in there, but that's what my eyes see, not what people who don't study nature, and specifically who don't study nature in cities, see. So here in LA, we should be studying nature because we are in a biodiversity hotspot, one of only 36 around the world. So a biodiversity hotspot it was designated, um, was defined by Conservation International. Again, there are 36 around the world. We here are in the California Floristic Province. And to be a biodiversity hotspot, you have to have at least 1,500 endemic vascular plant species. So just think of most plants, not mosses, liver warts, which are cool, but let's not think about them right now. So 1,500 endemic vascular plants, and then 70% of the habitat, original habitat, has to have been lost. Okay, again, also another depressing thing, getting back to hope. Um, so we are on par with places like the island of Madagascar, the tropical Andes, the Himalayas. There are plants and animals here in LA that exist here and literally nowhere else on the planet. People think about that for Madagascar, right? They think about that for, say, the tropical Andes. Like, I'm going to go on a vacation. I'm going to go see all these amazing plants and animals on Madagascar. People don't think about that when they're like, we're going to LA. No, they're thinking about going to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I'm like, it's just a sidewalk <laughs> with stuff on it. Um, so we are in a biodiversity hotspot. And here are some of those species that live here and nowhere else. So we've got our lovely friend, the El Segundo flower-loving fly. We've got the Southern California shoulder band snail. These snails live up in our mountains, maybe in the canyons. I've seen them when I'm hiking up there. They're gorgeous. They've got this beautiful chocolate-colored shell. And then we've got the um, island scrub jay, if you've ever been to the island of Santa Cruz, it's literally the only island that this bird lives on, and they exhibit island gigantism. So on the mainland, they're one size, and they've got larger over time as they evolved into this other species on the island. Very cool. I get to do this work. I get to study these creatures along with so many of my colleagues at the Natural History Museum. Scientists, and educators and science communicators, we all partner together. And these are many of my colleagues from the museum's Urban Nature Research Center. And this is what we've dedicated our lives and careers to. And a lot of people are like, why would, again, you're studying these plants and animals, why would you do it in a city? Why not go do it down in Costa Rica or Brazil? 
which is where our flight researcher, Dr. Brian Brown, the one with the brown shirt, top row, he goes down and, and does that. But we've also turned our eye to looking in urban spaces because again, this is where most people are living. If people are not connecting with nature in cities, then they're not gonna be learning to connect with nature. And we really need to have that connection to be able to make those next steps towards saving. So I'm gonna share with you, again, really exciting slide, I know. Bullet points, text, no pictures. Uh, I've tried to limit those. So I'm gonna tell you a few ways that we at the museum, through the decade of me working there, that we have tried to connect people with nature in all of these different ways. So we're gonna focus on a garden I worked on, an exhibit that I've worked on, a program that I work on all the time, a book, and I'll read a little bit out of this Wild LA book, a research project, and also an event. And a few of those you can participate in yourselves. We're gonna start off with the garden. So, when I got to the museum in 2008, I heard about this project. Let's take the parking lots and turn it into a garden. The County of Los Angeles gave us $10 million to build a new parking lot. We had to have the exact same number of parking spaces. Weird code regulations in Los Angeles about parking. Um, and we were able to do that by sinking it down underground and then freeing up the three and a half acres to be open space. Um, and this is what it looked like right after we got started. This was in 2011 after we'd broken ground. And then I went out today to try and take this exact same picture and realized that we'd built another part of the building where this picture was taken, so I couldn't do it. So this is as close as I could get. Sorry for the terrible lighting. It's very shadowy, but this is today. This is the nature gardens um, from close to the same view. Um, and that is, we're looking out over this bridge into the canopy of the trees that make up our urban wilderness. So again, three and a half acres of outdoor space. We wanted to create a place where kids could have safe, fun, outdoor nature experiences like I did when I was a kid. Okay, we don't have a hollow tree, but they can still pretend to be badgers. I don't know if people connect with badgers quite as much as we do in England, but maybe they can pretend to be a Western gray squirrel. So we've created this garden space where families can walk along six miles from downtown LA and imagine they're not in the city through a whole bunch of native plants, native trees, native shrubs. A place where teachers can bring their students, where they're learning to bird and then they can listen to the birds and see the birds, and then create a bird list for us. These were the kids that made the very first bird list for our nature gardens. A place where kids can learn how to grow vegetables and literally turn around and say, carrots grow in the ground? <laughs> and then they eat the carrot. A place for little ones to come and put their feet in cold water on really, really warm days, like today and a place where we can literally have people, kids and adults, get their hands in the soil, down into the compost, and search through and see what living creatures they can find. Are they gonna find a big beetle grub? I hope so. And if this isn't connecting people to nature, literally digging deeper into that nature, then I don't know what is. So, the garden opened in 2013, and then at the end of the garden project, we were told, well, close to the end, guys, we have 6,000 square feet and you can build an exhibit at the museum. Okay, cool, let's make that happen really fast. So we decided to build the Nature Lab. Most natural history museums, you've probably seen some of the iconic ones in lots of movies, um, the American Museum of Natural History, you go into these diorama holes, they're beautiful, they're gorgeous. They have exotic animals from all over the world. But we wanted to focus on not just exotic animals or the amazing nature of all over the United States. We just wanted to focus very specifically on the surprising biodiversity that is here in LA. Again, we're a biodiversity hotspot. We should be telling these stories. And so we built a space where kids and families can come in, get up close and personal with live animals, with taxidermy mounts, 
and also some digital interactions that will help people to understand what's going on. And of course, live animals, that's our little sword owl, uh, sorry, Western screech owl. He's called Odin, he only has one eye. And so families and kids get to meet our animal ambassadors. And I'll introduce you to my, one of my favorite animal ambassadors in a few slides. So we wanted to split the exhibit up and tell the stories about nature in Los Angeles. So this section of the exhibit focuses in on introduced and invasive species, what animals and plants come into LA, and then can maybe, they, maybe they can go wild. So we have stories about killer cats, house cats that is, um, the, eastern and western, uh, the eastern fox squirrel and the western gray squirrel and how they are having a turf war. Um, and then all of those little boxes on the right with the branches in, those are filled with black and brown widows, live ones, yeah. We also wanted to tell stories about how animals, some species have specifically got used to living in the city and by exploiting our built environment. And so this is an interactive where kids can look inside of these little viewfinders like those ones from the 1980s um, that some of you may remember and see what species are living, cohabitating with us in our houses. Some of my favorite species, just kidding, not really a fan of the cockroaches. They're on the sidewalks all night in LA. And then there's a section where we focus on what happens to those species that can't live in highly altered habitats that humans have started to create, like the mountain lions, like roadrunners, rattlesnakes, and how they have been pushed to the edges. And so we wanted to make sure we told their stories as well. And then this is Ham the opossum. Ham just passed away, unfortunately. Um, did you know opossums only live three years? That's their like literal maximum lifespan. Um, they're marsupials, they're really cool. We got to tell so many amazing stories with Ham. Um, about how when they're born, they're the size of a lima bean, and they crawl out and then get back into the pouch. There's only 13 teats, so the first 13 that get there, also 13, what an interesting number for the number of teats for a uh, mama opossum to have. Um, and so Ham has touched the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, of children and adults who have come to help get a real, literal, up close and personal experience with nature in LA and to help change conservation behaviors of people, to not leave their pet food outside at night, to make sure that uh, they have a safe space for their pets and for the native wildlife that live here with us. Okay, we're moving on to the program. So as I was introduced as the senior manager for community science, um, anyone heard the term community science before? Citizen science? So um, we changed the name a couple of, uh, about a year ago to citizen science um, because it's not the most inclusive. I'm not a citizen of this country. And um, it's definitely, when you say the word citizen in the United States, it definitely means something different than when you say citizen in many other places around the world. So we wanted to be inclusive of the staff that we have and the people that we work with. And so change the name to community science. It's the same thing as citizen science. It's when the public work with scientists to answer real world questions. And so it really, we're really focusing in on a community. And this is the community that we've been working with. Lots and lots of families and adults from all over the LA region. The projects that we engage this community in range and um, here are six of our most kind of ongoing and popular. You can tell that we really love acronyms. Our scientists like are super acronym happy. So we've got Bioscan, Biodiversity Science, City and Nature. And that's putting up malaise traps, which are insect traps in people's backyards all across LA and see what flying insects fly into there and they go up to the top and then they get stuck in the jar of death. We take killing things very seriously we don't want to kill anything for no reason, but we're doing it for science and we're discovering new species. So um, we've got rascals, reptiles and amphibians of Southern California. Again, focusing on reptiles and amphibians. Where do they live? What species are here? What introduced species are here? Like this green anole. Um, 
the LA Nature Map, it's our broadest one. It covers the entire of LA County, and it's any picture of any organism, fungus, slime mold, mammal, bird, or evidence of life. So it could be a track, it could be scat, it could be bones. Um, and that's the one that we have the most observations for. Slime, snails and slugs living in metropolitan environments. <laughs> Plus, I see what they did there. Um, the LA Spider Survey, which has been going on since 2001, people have literally sent us almost 6,000 live, sometimes dead, spiders, and they have now live in our collection in perpetuity to live there for 100, 200, the next number of years. Who knows? We, 100 years ago, we didn't know we could do DNA testing on museum collection items. What are they going to be able to do 100 years from now with these specimens? What questions will they be able to ask? What answers will they be able to get? And then last but not least, the Southern California Squirrel Survey. Again, really looking at that turf war between the Eastern Fox Squirrels and the Western Gray Squirrels. But also, did you guys know we have a flying squirrel here in Southern California that lives off in the mountains? I've never seen one in real life, but it's a dream of mine. So the bottom three plus the nature map all use iNaturalist. Who are iNaturalist users in the room? Oh my gosh, we got so many new iNaturalist users in the room. That's what that means. So iNaturalist is basically a platform like Facebook, but it's like Facebook for nature nerds. You take a picture with your smartphone or just regular digital camera, and then you upload it. You can use the app on your phone, which is free, or you can go to your computer with your digital camera and upload them. And then they get put onto your profile. And then other nat naturalists, other scientists, will help you identify what you have found. Um, they also can have whole conversations online. So, ooh, that's interesting. I've never seen that species in that part of the world. Maybe there's a range expansion that should be happening. So we're going to talk a little bit more about iNaturalist, but I just wanted to get you familiar with it before we move on. Here are a few stories about some of the cool things we found through community science. So I don't know if you're on social media much, but I love looking for hashtag snails and things. So we decided one year to do this thing called Snail Blitz. And it was during the El Nino rainstorm. And we're like, OK, we just started this project. Our malacologist, Dr. Jan Vendetti, had just started the museum. Let's do this. Let's get everyone to send us snail and slug pictures, because it's raining and they'll be out. I was really excited. Other people in the museum were excited. And then regular people were excited, too. OK, so Type Fiend, who I now know and I'm friends with, he wasn't excited. He didn't know. But he just loves taking pictures of nature things from his backyard. So he got this nasturtium leaf. He found these snails. And he's like, oh, I'll make this design. I'm a super designy person. Um, and then my friend Skate Mamas was like, Leela Kaleelopter, that's my Instagram name, which is the scientific name Beetle, with my work name Leela jammed in the middle. It's really memorable. It's really great to have a social media handle that's like really easy to remember. OK, just kidding. Uh, so Skate Mamas was like, Leela, look. And I was like, oh my goodness. I've never seen snails like this before. Hey, Type Fiend, can we put it on our um, slime snail blitz uh, uh, project? And he says, You're, sure, go ahead. So then we put it on iNaturalist. And then this is the conversation. OK, a my, tiny part of the conversation that ensued. People were like, what? I don't think I know this species has ever been found in California before. And then we've got people from England, Susan Hewitt, who like helps us ID snails, and this guy, Phil P. Glyph. And then finally, Jan Vandetti, our snail scientist, chimes in. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to their house. <laughs> so he posted on Instagram. And then like a day later, the scientist is like, can I come to your house and find these snails in your backyard? And, and Greg, uh, Gregory and Emily Hahn is the name of the, the people. And they said, yes. So there's Jan. That's Gregory and Emily Hahn's backyard. And so Jan goes to their backyards, finds the snails, identifies them. They are a species that's never before been found in Los Angeles County. And then we published a paper. And Emily and Gregory Hahn are recognized in the paper as contributors 
literally, we couldn't have found this species in LA without them. Okay, maybe someone else would have found it, but it is essential for community scientists, community members, to let us know if they're finding something like this. And they just never had a way to do that before. I mean, I get pictures of things all the time. Leela, I found this in my backyard. Most of the time, it's something that I've seen many times before, but sometimes it's a brand new species to LA. Another story about a different species, brand new to LA. So this is Dr. Greg Pauly. He is our herpetologist. He's holding an introduced Italian wall lizard. A guy from Italy liked these lizards. He put them in a suitcase. He brought them to America. Slightly illegal, um, but somehow he didn't get caught and they are now all over the San Pedro area. But that's not what we're gonna talk about right now. We can talk about this picture. So this picture got sent to Greg, got submitted um, to a project. And this guy, Glenn Yoshida, was like, okay, I found this. This doesn't look like any of the other lizards that I've really seen before. House gecko, question mark. And this was from April, 2013. Greg calls the guy on the phone. This is really cool. Do you mind if I come to your house? Um, and like normal people say to normal scientists, sure, come on down tomorrow. So Greg goes down and he searches around the house, finds a whole bunch of other lizards, finds this tiny white thing between the downspout and the side of the building, which is a hatched egg. And you can see also, um, does the laser pointer work? Ooh, yeah. So that light colored area is um, an egg inside of the female. Um, and so we know that they've been breeding. It's not just one individual that like maybe got there from the port of Los Angeles, came out of a potted plant. And turns out um, Glenn has noticed them in his neighborhood, in his, around his house since around 2011. And this was the very first time this lizard was found in LA County. Same thing happens a few months later in June, this guy Bob Warrell who lives in Lake Forest, takes pictures, sends them to Greg, and same species, Greg goes down to the house, hangs out with them at night. These lizards are nocturnal, so again, it just makes it weirder, like, I'm gonna come to your house at night, is that okay? Um, and so, Greg goes down, the, they're confirmed in this area, so this is the first record for, for Orange County. And so this also, whoops, this also re, re, resulted in a, um, publication. And so two different species, completely different areas of LA, brand new range expansions to science. Okay, this one's my favorite. Not just because it's flies. So this is Dr. Brian Brown, our entomologist. And here we are posing for a picture. Um, Brian really likes to uh, make bets. So he was at a dinner party with some trustees from the museum. And he was like, I bet I could find a new fly here in LA just as easily as I could down in my research sites in Costa Rica and Brazil. And the donor put their hand across the table, shook hands with Brian and said, you're on. So then Brian goes and sets up a trap very, very similar to this one. It's called a malaise trap, not because it's really sad about life, um, but because the person's last name who invented it was malaise. So it's always, it's always spelled with a capital M fun fact for Trivial Pursuit later. So there's Brian with the malaise trap, holding the jar of death, contemplating it. Weighty issues, lots of dead insects. He puts this trap up in a backyard in Brentwood next to a person's swimming pool. He leaves it for a week. He goes back, he gets the jar of death, and then brings it back to the museum. It was in a gray Poupon mustard jar. <laughs> I don't know why I like that one. It's a fun fact, but I do. Um, he brings it back to the museum, he takes out all the insects that are not flies, then he sorts out just the flies that he studies. He is the world's leading expert on forehead flies, aka humpback flies. They literally have a hump on their back, hence the name. They're also called scuttle flies because of the way they scuttle around. There's the humpback. So he goes through, sorts out just the humpback flies, and starts to go through the sample, finds one that he thinks looks interesting, and then takes it through the key, and it's a brand new species to science. Never before been discovered. It's that big one with the head popped off, because that's how you have to put them on slides. 
He finds another fly in the same sample, and he's like, ooh, that's a really cool penultimate tarsal segment of the leg there. Takes it through the key. This one has never before been found in North America, only known from Europe. Third fly, there are a whole bunch of flies. The third one that was interesting was this one down here. Took it through the key. Also never before found in North America, only known from the east and west coast of Africa. So in just one week's worth of sampling, just looking at forehead flies, he makes three important discoveries, a new species and two range expansions, just from this tiny group of flies. And then he's like, well, that was cool. What if we put these traps in 30 people's backyards all across LA? And so working with families and people from our community, we put up these three traps, 30 traps, left them up for three years. And guess how many new fly species, forward fly species we discovered? 70? Well, that's really optimistic. Um, 47 so far, close. So these were the first 30 that were found. A paper was written. The people from the families helped to name the species of flies. And so these were the first 30 um, uh, that, were, that were described. But again, we're up to, I think, 47 new species now. So by the numbers, community science at our museum has contributed to 26 publications. Again, the 47 or so fly species discovered. We have about 5,500-ish spider specimens in our collection that are there for now and are in perpetuity. We have about 5,700 photographic squirrel observations, 14,000 snail and slug observations, and almost 50,000 reptile and amphibian observations. And then in our LA Nature Map, over 212,000 observations in total. So we think we're doing fairly well. So if a garden doesn't work to connect you to nature and an exhibit doesn't work to connect you to nature and you don't want to do community science, maybe a book will help. So while we were working on the nature lab and the nature gardens, we kept telling all of these stories. And we'd come in to work and we'd be like, oh my gosh, I heard some coyotes while I was watching the um, Shakespeare in the Park in Griffith Park. And then all of a sudden during the middle of the show, they had to stop because a pack of coyotes were howling for like a minute. And the actors on stage were laughing, blah, blah, blah. And so when we told stories like that, other people would start telling their stories. And we thought, wouldn't it be nice to be able to like put all those stories that we have into one place? And then we're like, it would be really easy to write a book. It's not. We really wanted to make sure that this book was uh, easy to pick up, easy to read, um, lots of great pictures, lots of amazing uh, maps and things. We have an amazing illustrator. Um, and also a book that you could maybe have in your bathroom and pick up while you're doing other things and, and, and get some tidbits of fun factoids, so to speak. So let's talk about LA's claim to fame. We have quite a few claims to fame. So in one day, Californians brag that they can ski and surf in the same day. LA naturalists can brag too, because you can see wild bighorn sheep and green sea turtles in the same day. Did you guys know that? No. Has anyone been up to Mount Baldy or anywhere in the San Gabriels and seen the bighorn sheep? Anyone been to see the green sea turtles down at the bottom of the San Gabriel River? Oh, one person. Okay, you need to go. It's field trip number 22. Okay, I don't think it's 22. But it's one of the field trips in here. And that's a picture we took from that day um, of the green sea turtles. They live next to the warm water outflows of a power plant. Are they native? They're not. So it's a... Okay, so it's a range expansion. They are further south. There are some in San Diego. So we're the, we have the most northern populate, uh, mini population of the green sea turtles, and it's because of the warm water. But with climate change, might they have warmer water here? Or I don't know what's happening with the currents of water and climate change. So that's one fun factoid. Did you know Los Angeles is the only city in the United States with a major mountain range running through it? Thank you, Santa Monica Mountains. Anyone know that?
LA County has the greatest difference between its lowest and highest points of any county in the United States, ranging from sea level to, anyone know how tall Mount Baldy is? 10,064. And last one. Did you know Los Angeles is the birdiest county in the country with over 500 recorded species? How do we get so many birds? We have a huge number of native species, lots of non-native species that thrive thanks to our climate, plus lots of visitors passing through as they migrate along the Pacific coast. Again, I mean, we could just go on forever. So the book, we decided that we wanted to have some background chapters, help people understand what's going on with nature here, why are we so full of nature, um, going back in time to the La Brea Tar Pits, because we also run that museum. Wow, some amazing fauna here, 10 to 50,000 years ago. Um, talking a lot about the LA River, what species come out after dark, and then, of course, a chapter on community science, science by the people. And as you can see, you won't open the book ever and just see walls of text. We didn't want it to be that kind of book. We wanted to make sure that there were lots of images, those factoids, those call-outs, and those green boxes. So it appealed to a wide range of audience, from younger people to older people. We've heard some really cute stories of families having to get more than one copy because the kid won't let the parents have the book. There's also 101 species accounts in here. Um, we wanted to make sure that there, it was filled with species that you might see every day, um, species that you maybe had never heard of that might be harder to find, aspirational species like the bighorn sheep. Um, and we wanted to make sure we had a really good taxonomic diversity. We didn't want to just do birds and mammals. They're cool, but most of the life around here is actually insects and, and other species. So we got some snails, a slug, mushrooms, slime mold, some plants, and our state lichen. Did you guys know we had a state lichen? <laughs> we, are, we are literally the only state with a state lichen. Thank you, California Lichen Society. It's the lace lichen, it's really cool. And then 25 field trips. So again, to be a field guide, to help people explore nature throughout LA area. Um, where's the San Gabriel River one? There, oh, it's trip 22. 22, go see the green sea turtles. And shout out to the amazing Martha Rich who did the illustrations, the cover of the book, um, and all of the maps inside. Okay, I'm going to just read two really quick stories from, from here. Fun fact and then a story. Okay, you ready for some wild snail facts? <laughs> like other snails, the common garden snail is a hermaphrodite, which means it is both male and female at the same time. When a pair comes together, each harpoons the other with a love dart. It introduces hormones to induce mating. To reproduce, they intertwine their bodies and extend their penises from behind their heads to exchange sperm. Mating can take anywhere between four and 12 hours. <laughs> yeah, and I took some snails to uh, a National Science Foundation event, and then they started doing this, and the kids were like, what is going on? I'm like, well, okay, <laughs> let's break it down. This is biology 101, and you're in grade school. Um, but yeah, these are the European garden snails. They were introduced because they, farmers thought that they might be able to um, uh, farm them and people would eat them. But surprisingly, that didn't work out so well. Okay, quick story about a lovely elementary school. Leo Politi Elementary School sits just two miles from downtown Los Angeles in one of the densest parts of the city. This means there's not that much room for nature to grow or kids to play. A few years ago, Principal Brad Rumble um, decided he wanted to grow a garden and took an empty part of campus. With the help of students from a nearby high school, they planted sages, oaks, monkey flowers, and other native species. They dug a vernal pool, then waited for the birds and insects to show up. Teachers began using the space for lessons, and Brad took students there to talk things through when they were troubled. Not long after the garden grew in, wildlife turned up. The students counted dozens of species of birds in the garden and hundreds of insects. 
but that was expected. The surprise was that student disciplinary issues dropped to almost zero and science test scores skyrocketed. Brad said they went from the basement to the penthouse in science. Before the garden, 9% of Leo Politi students tested proficient in science. After the garden was planted, 54% did. Gardens don't just benefit wildlife, they also benefit us. And I get emotional every time I read that. And these kids are awesome, and so is that teacher. Okay, we're getting close to the end. So the research that we've been working on, um, it's a collaboration between, um, it's funded by the National Science Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and the Economic Social Research Council, because it's a combination between the UK and the US. So Natural History Museum in London, Natural History Museum in LA, and the California Academy of Sciences are the three museums. And this is the giant project team, and it's specifically a collaboration between learning researchers and community science practitioners. And so we're working together to look about how youth aged five to 19, what do they develop environmental science agency-wise? Do they become more proficient at science skill-wise? Do they feel like I can, they can identify as scientists? Do they feel like they know the tools to use? Do they feel like they can go and do science to solve a problem in their own neighborhood, in their school, somewhere after our program? And we're looking at that in the online setting, so Online Naturalist or the Zooniverse, if you're familiar with that platform, um, at our one-day events called BioBlitzes, and then also in our ongoing projects, specifically in LA, the Super Project, which is a year-long project where people survey their neighborhood. We're looking at environmental science agency again. Do they get to learn science concepts and skills? Do they feel like they can understand their role in science? I can do observations, or I can use this uh, insect net really well, or I'm really good at taking pictures that scientists will be able to identify. And then three, taking that back and developing agency so they can do that science later on. Again, we're looking at kids five to 19, and we are in the th going into the very beginning of the third year of this project. We are starting to do design-based research. All of the things that we found out so far, what can we change in our programs to see if kids are actually developing their science agency? So are we gonna start using tools at our programs that have been used at the museums in the other places? Again, it's very early days. We're gonna have a whole bunch of publications coming out, but we're also not just public in the publishing in the scientific literature. We're gonna be making sure that practitioners know what, how to do this, how to do these programs. Okay, this is my favorite one. We're almost at the end. Has anyone ever heard of the City Nature Challenge? Oh my gosh, there's so many people who haven't, and I'm really excited for you guys to participate this year. It's a competition between cities around the world. It started in 2016, LA versus San Francisco. Which city has the most nature? Which city has the best Baseball team, clearly the Dodgers, not the Giants. Which city has the best burrito? You don't go to San Francisco and eat burritos. Which city has the highest rent? Okay, that one's not funny. Um, and so we, we, got, we got the mayor of LA involved. He got a picture of a snail. He took pictures of a snail, and he actually has an iNaturalist account. And that first year, we beat San Francisco. We got 20,000 observations total between the two cities, and about 1,000 people participated. We would do it talking about it on Twitter. Other cities were like, whoa, that's cool. Can we do it next year? So in 2017, 16 cities across the United States took part. And we got 124,000 observations of about 8,000 species with 4,000 people. So we kind of bumped up and grew. And then in 2018, we're like, why not? It's really easy. This isn't much work. Let's go global. 68 cities from around the world, 430,000 observations, 18,000 species, and 17,000 people. What? How did we get so many? And then last year, oh my goodness, we had 168 cities, I think it was. Yeah, 400,000 observations or so. Um, and we had how many species? 18,000 species, 17,000 people. This year, even more, goodness gracious. Um, and we got almost a million observations from 31,000 species from the world, around the world, and 35,000 people participated. 
And we almost had all of the consonants, but uh, Antarctica, come on. Where are you at? I know it's not very urban, the McMurdo Science Research Station down there, but I'm going to say it counts. This year, 2020, are you guys ready? OK. I'm not sure if Orange County is participating, but LA County is just over there. You can just go anywhere over the border. And um, it's going to be April 24th to the 27th for taking pictures. Then there's an identification phase. And then we'll announce the results on May 4th. We think we're going to get 1.25 million observations, 40,000 species, and 50,000 people. And I'm hoping we can get Antarctica on board. This is a graph from my naturalist. Every year, we have like broke the system. They've almost broken the whole computer. Um, and we have been sustaining more usership year after year. And this means that people will be able to go out and they're trained up. They'll be able to go collect data. If they have a weird lizard on their wall at their house, they can take it, upload it to iNaturalist. And then hopefully, the scientist that needs that data will be able to find it. All of the data gets shared with the Global Biodiversity Inventory Facility, <clears throat> information facility. We share our data with our sustainability offices. So it is helping to change policy. It is helping to change LA and hopefully other areas around the world too. We're encouraging our organizers to do that. So what next? We got the LA 2050 grant, $100,000 to continue doing this work and to reach 10,000 new people in the LA area. Very exciting. What if we had all the cities who were in biodiversity hotspots take place, take part in the City Nature Challenge? We've also test, been testing these community science kits that hopefully will go in every single library in the county of LA so kids like this can have tools that they need to go and explore the nature outside. All of this gives me hope. It makes me hopeful when I see kids and teachers building school gardens, collecting data, disciplinary issues going down, and science test scores going up. It gives me hope when we discover new species right here in our own backyard, so we know what they are, and they know how they live, and so we can protect them. It gives me hope when a species that we thought was extinct is found again. And it gives me hope when I see the looks on child's faces like this, when they are in awe and inspired by nature, hopefully inspired enough to then go and study it and be the leaders for the coming future that will help our planet to be a better place for wildlife and humans to live. Thank you.